All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Coffee Conversations with Forge, First Cancer Survivor Center. I'm Janaya Holt. Um, we're here today with Dr. Nancy Murner, the Principal Investigator of Gene Machine. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in with us this morning, and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Murner. Uh, we are just so excited about this conversation and just really um, looking forward to, you know, learning more about um, Gene Machine and everything. So, um, we'll go ahead and start if that's okay with you. Yes. Okay, so uh, Dr. Myrna, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure, I am an assistant professor at Auburn University and I study breast cancer genetics. Um, and a little bit on a personal note, I married my high school sweetheart, Brad Murner, who is also a professor at Auburn University. And we have two daughters, Abby and Sophie, and two dogs, Chloe and Patty. Um, I am born, well, I was born and raised in Newfoundland, Canada, and that's where I got my PhD in human genetics. Um, and for my PhD, I studied hereditary deafness, breast cancer, and ARVC, which is a form of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. I share that with you because it's a form of sudden cardiac death that was the discovery. I found the discovery, or sorry, I found the gene that caused ARVC type 5 in the Newfoundland population, and it was my biggest accomplishment through my PhD. Um, that discovery actually really heavily influenced who I am today as a researcher because I was involved in reporting back to study participants and translating that result to the clinic. Um, and which inspired the program that I developed today at Auburn. After my PhD, I moved to Montreal uh, for a postdoc in neurogenetics, and that's where I found the first gene for um, essential tremor. But ultimately here at Auburn now, I uh, developed a breast cancer genetics program, and I have a passion to help people, and I designed a study to reach individuals who typically are underrepresented in research. And this can include people who live in rural areas and minority groups. Wow, that's incredible. Um, thank you for you know sharing that with us. And um, I just want to commend you on all of those wonderful accomplishments. Um, and another fun now, that's a big house of girls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, got daughters and dogs, like all those girls. How did your husband cope? <laughs> yeah, he, he got a special shout out the other day for Father's Day for just elegantly living with us in all our idiosyncrasies. <laughs> Especially okay. now that my, my oldest daughter is a teenager, so. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, um, so, you know, getting into it, what exactly is Gene Machine? So the Gene Machine is a big pink bus that our team uses to study breast cancer genetics. Uh, initially, we design, uh, designed the bus to reach people all over the state of Alabama. Um, it has a nice pink wrap that's attention grabbing. It was also refurbished to include everything necessary to enroll study participants into our breast cancer genetic study. So we travel all over the state to community events to bring awareness. Um, and we also travel to enrollment sessions in order to bridge gaps in research Yay. participation. So when someone lives in rural Alabama, we like to... Um, and would like to participate in our study, we travel to them such that transportation is no longer an obstacle. Um, we also provide cancer genetic uh, education sessions and travel to those sessions on the Gene Machine. And we've recently created a website specifically for the Gene Machine called um, genemachine.info, um, where all of this is described and it's video based so you can learn more about it um, and what we do. Oh, I think that's incredible. And I think it's important to note that um, taking the transportation barrier out of receiving those services, I think that is just really commendable. Um, a lot of individuals don't tip, it's not first of mind to think about, you know, transportation to certain resources is a huge barrier for those rural communities. So I think that's awesome. Thank you. Um, another thing, um, I noticed that your lab is, you know, of course, with Auburn Veterinary School, but you're studying the genetics of breast cancer. So can you just give us a little bit of information on your research looking at humans or animals? 
Yeah, so I am at the vet school at Auburn University, and that's a question that comes up frequently. So my research team studies both humans and dogs with breast cancer. So we'll study the DNA of you and your family members if you have a family history of breast cancer, but we'll also study the DNA of your dog if your dog had canine mammary tumors, um, which is the same as human breast cancer. So you might have not known this about dogs, but there are a lot like humans. And by studying dogs, like we do it in parallel, um, so it can really help find new breast cancer genes that ultimately can solve human breast cancer cases. Wow, that's incredible. Um, I would have never really even thought about that, just the genealogy of, because I have a pet as well. Um, my dog, he's a Labradoodle. And um, seeing his personality and everything like that, um, thinking about the genetic piece of that, I think is really cool. Mm. Yeah, so... Um, why is research-based genetic screening beneficial? Well, it's beneficial for many reasons. Uh, firstly, I need to explain that there are a number of clinically relevant breast cancer risk genes, including BRCA1 and 2. And when an individual has a mutation in one of those genes, their lifetime risk of developing breast cancer can be as high as 85%. Um, if someone gets clinical genetic screening, they'll have genetic counseling and follow risk management strategies based on the mutation they have. So this can include yearly mammograms and breast MRIs for early detection, and it can also include prophylactic procedures like a mastectomy where you get your breast removed to re uh, reduce risk. However, many people in our study have not had clinical genetic screening. This can be for a number of reasons, such as they were never offered it, or they were afraid, or they didn't qualify for the screening based on their insurance, or they are uninsured, or they simply don't have access to such care. So in our research lab, we screen for clinically relevant breast cancer genes and give participants the option to receive a research report. Now we take that to the next step and offer a pathway to clinical care by offering genetic counseling and clinical screening. This offers an avenue for a study participant to get their mutation clinically validated so that they can follow those recommended risk management strategies like the yearly mammograms, which are designed to save lives. Um, but now, um, here's another point that I need to stress. Most people who qualify and receive breast cancer genetic screening do not have a mutation in a clinically relevant breast cancer gene. So if you fit the criteria for breast cancer genetic screening and you and your family members get that screening, but cancer risk is still unexplained, so you are negative, that does not mean that there isn't a mutation in your family. What that does mean is that no one has found your family's mutation yet. So there are only a handful of clinically relevant breast cancer genes compared to the number of genes in our DNA. So my lab searches for new breast cancer genes and mutations, which is very important. So if you haven't had clinical genetic screening and would like to join our study, we can inform you if we find a mutation in a clinically relevant gene. If you don't, um, if we don't find a mutation in a clinically relevant breast cancer gene, we do not stop there. That's where the research comes in and we search for new ones, which is very important and we need participants to do that. Um, now, if you had had clinical genetic screening, you were either negative, positive, or were told you had a variant of unknown significance. We would like you to participate no matter the scenario. We will screen for new genes in people who are negative. We will screen for, we will study the variant of unknown significance if that's what you were told you had. And we can also even look for genetic factors that modify risk in people that actually had a mutation report. Um, so all in all, research is very important to learn about gen like breast cancer genetics and we need everyone's help in making discoveries. Wow. Um... That's amazing, um, just to be able to get that information and those services. Um, I know breast cancer runs in my family. So, I mean, it would be really great to just know what the specific type of breast cancer um, based off of that research and, and getting further services if you don't know what type of gene it is that you might have. Mm -hmm. um, in order for somebody to find out this information and to participate in your program um, and your study, what 
qualifies them? Okay, well, firstly, um, our new website, which is genemachine.info. So, and when I got to stress that gene is spelled G-E-N-E, -E, not jeans like we wear every day. So Gene Machine is G-E-N-E-M-A-C-H-I-N-E -E dot info, I-N-F-O. So everything is described on that website. But briefly, um, if you were diagnosed with breast cancer at or under the age of 45, you qualify for our study. Also, we study people with a family history of breast cancer. So if you were diagnosed with breast cancer and have a family history of breast, ovarian, pancreatic, or prostate cancer, you will likely qualify. Um, I'm not gonna go into the specific details about all of that because you know they're very specific about if you were diagnosed between this age and then had relatives with this, but all of that is on the website. And also please reach out to us if you have any questions. But ultimately, if you were diagnosed with breast cancer with a family history of breast, ovarian, pancreatic, or prostate cancer, you will likely qualify. Um, another thing I wanna stress too is that breast cancer uh, is inherited in like a syndrome and it's not always associated with just breast cancer. So that's why the other cancers are in there because if your dad had prostate cancer um, or if your brother did, or even an uncle, or if your grandmother had pancreatic cancer, um, it could all be linked. So that's important to stress. Um, another criteria that's important is if you were diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer under the age of 60, that is very important. That's with or without a family history, you would automatically qualify. And then lastly, male breast cancer, diagnosed at any age. Male breast cancer is very rare. Um, if we see it, it's typically a sign or characteristic that it's hereditary breast cancer. So any males can participate who've been diagnosed. So um, a quick question. So I know you mentioned like if it's in your family. So if you get diagnosed with um, a cancer or a breast cancer, and if it if a cancer has run in your family, does that just mean um, immediate family members, or um, could it just be like various family members? Like, is there a certain structure that um, would qualify them? Like, only if your aunt got it or your mom got it, or you know, even great grandparents. What um, would so, that qualify them, or is there a limit? There, well, it's a limit, um, and it's it has to do with your first, second, and third degree relatives. So a first degree relative is someone who's just like one step away from you in your pedigree. So it's either a sibling or a parent or a child. Second, deg second degree relatives is two steps away. So it's your grandparents or aunts and uncles, like just, and then third degree is three steps away. So it it's still, most people, when you think about your family circle, it might only go back three steps away. Um, but it's also very good to know, you know, past generations and histories, but you would qualify if you are aware of first, second, and third degree relatives who've had those cancers. Oh, that's great to know. Um, so are there any risk um, or any potential risk for that participant should consider before they enroll and participate in this research study? Yeah, there are risks and benefits to participating in research. Uh, and again, um, all of this is described on our website. I'd like to go to benefits first because it's the fun stuff. Um, if you enroll in the study, we give gift cards to participants. Um, we also offer the free genetic screening and free genetic counseling. Um, and participating overall, though, is just for the greater good as well. Like if, if you don't need the free genetic screening or, you know, and any of that, but you want to help out, um, just participating helps your community, it helps other survivors, and it helps us as researchers to make discoveries. Um, so they're the, type, they're the benefits. Um, regarding risk, though, this is just basically an observational study. It is not a clinical trial, so there's no huge risk in participating. But what you do need to know is that when we gather your information, when you enroll in the study, we safely and securely store your information, and we do not share it with outside parties. So it's very safe. And, you know, this project in the G-Machine is all about building trust and I know that takes time and building relationships, but when you get to know us, you, you'll, you'll hopefully feel that sense and know that we are doing the right 
thing and that we have your best interests at heart. Um, there are also emotional risks in knowing your genetic risk, and that's where the counseling comes in and why we're providing that. Um, there is a minimum risk of the sample donation because we need something to screen your DNA. So we can collect saliva or blood. We used to only collect blood because we were always in person receiving samples and blood gives us the biggest volume of DNA to study over time. But recently, especially because of the pandemic, we also uh, designed virtual enrollment sessions. And again, though, the virtual enrollment, we use HIPAA compliance, so that's very protective. Auburn University Zoom um, and it's, it's a specific type of Zoom so that it is not um, compromised. Um, so we use that for those sessions. And so the concept of the G machine of us driving to you, um, now we can also safely consent online. So this is great for the pandemic, but it's also great for our reach. We are not limited to Alabama now. We were only limited to Alabama because we had to travel through mm -hmm. Alabama. Now we can, if, if someone lives in Washington or in Chicago, they can enroll and you know we can all participate. Um, but yes, but just know that there are risks um, and we try to minimize them and uh, all there for the greater good. Yeah, the benefit um, is so much more than the than the risk. Um, just knowing and and helping others by knowing, um, I think is is the huge benefit of that. Um, I completely agree. Um, so, I also noticed your team is driven like all across the state, and I mean, congratulations! Now that you're able to reach outside of the state, um, so is there any specific event that really stood out to you? Well, all the events are special because it's all about meeting people. Um, you know, just meeting the community, my extended Alabama community, building relationships and coming together for the greater good, like you just said, and I know I've reiterated several times, but one thing that absolutely sticks out is actually attending family reunions. So this is just, you know, it's a personal level where you're going to someone's family reunion and talking about their cancer risk. If someone in that family notices the pattern, you know, of cancer diagnosis and perhaps death. So we have one particular family that we started going to their family reunion like several years ago. Um, and we have now attended three reunions. So every time that they host a reunion, we go back. We've traveled to Nashville to see like their first reunion. We've like, it was in state. And then, you know, because their family has dispersed, we've gone and we followed them. Um, and but honestly, and we're even going to their next reunion uh, this summer. Um, but over 20 individuals from that family have participated um, based on this you know, relationship that we've built and it really means a lot. So that's an example that I'd like to share. That is so cool. Um, and another quick question. So like once they participate in the study, like how long would it be before they knew the results of their participation? Well, that's something really important to stress because research screening takes research dollars and a lot more time than clinical screening. So the consent form actually does stress that if you want this information to make clinical information, like you go talk to your daughter, a doctor and get clinical screening. Um, and it really depends on the time that you enrolled in the study. Sometimes you enroll and we're ready to do like another panel screening and you get on there right away and you can get it relatively fast. Other times we have to wait for a certain number of samples to come into the lab to be able to do it more cost effectively so it can take more time. Um, but, you know, we're getting better at getting the results out sooner. And we're always thinking about ways to improve and actually maybe even um, providing clinical screening um, through the study as well. But that's just things that we're discussing and trying to evolve over time. 
Wow, well, that's awesome. Um, and thank you for um, clarifying that. I don't, because I know oftentimes we might think about, um, you know, the, especially since, um, you know, it's a pink, the G machine, it's a pink bus. Um, sometimes when we see like testing that is um, provided in that setting, some people think they get instant results. Mm. So it's really great to know that this takes time. It's not going to happen immediately. <laughs> and it is like it's an observational longitudinal study, which means, you know, you just, it's very simple to enroll and you give us a sample, but this is my career. Like this is what I'm dedicating my career to. And you provide a sample that will, I can screen in 10 years and 15 years when technology changes and we have more information. And so we really, the, the whole concept of the G machine and the fact that we have our website, we have a toll free number for people to call us whenever we have a G, um, an email set up, um, which um, I can give you. But um, all this is again, just that relationship building. Um, you could hear from us initially and in saying, okay, you were negative, but we're still gonna keep screening. You, we send out newsletters so that you're informed of what we're currently doing, but you can also reach out to us and say, hey, has my sample helped? Have you, you know, have you had any success? So it's um, long-term, in it for the long haul. <laughs> well, thanks for um, letting us know and clarifying that. Um, so if someone's interested in participating in your research study, um, what are the next steps um, that they would need to take? Um, okay, so, um, Basically, we like I was just hinting that we have a toll free number. You, you can reach out to us. So our toll free number is 855-388-8270. So that's one way that you can get in touch with us. Another way is through email. It's gene, G-E-N-E at Auburn, A-U-B-U-R-N dot E-D-U. So those are email and a toll-free phone number that you can reach out to us. Um, but genemachine.info, our new website, also has multiple ways that you can contact us. Um, so if you go to our website, um, you can fill out a form and that comes directly to us as well. So there's multiple ways. I do want to introduce you to my research uh, coordinator, um, Betsy Stallworth, who's on the call today as well. She is the person who you'll first um, be in contact with when you reach out to us. I am always available as well, um, but our work is truly teamwork, including everyone in my lab and then beyond, um, because it's just so important to work together. Awesome. So um, do you have any final tips or information that you'd like to leave our viewers with today? Um, just don't be afraid. Like I am a mom of two daughters, um, a mom of two dogs, I love to exercise. Like I'm human. I grew up um, just, you know, looking at other people of a different status and be like, oh, I'm not them. But it's not like that. You know, everyone's the same. And oh, geez, I could even tear up saying that, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're all equal and in it, you know, just to improve health and of our study participants. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Werner, for joining us today and giving us um, so much valuable information and just making the community more aware of the amazing resource that you all are and how you're able to go all across the state and now even virtually reaching other states. Um, I just think that's amazing. Um, thank you for just making our community more aware. And we are so excited to um, see you again soon. Thank you.